So uh, growing up in the 70s was rough, especially in Mason Park. It's a really poor area of town. <clears throat> um, a lot of degenerates and whatnot come out of there. There was uh, really a breeding ground for depression and uh, alcoholism and drug addiction, that sort of thing. Um, fortunately enough for me, I came out of there with both. Um, it wasn't really um, anything to do with my uh, parents or my home life or anything. It was more uh, to do with the, the people in general. My cleft palate was rough. I was bullied a lot. Um, I, <clears throat> I didn't really had no self-worth at all. Um, and that led to a lot of negative things in my life as far as uh, just being beat up a lot. I was, I was beat up on. I never fought back. Uh, I had an older brother and stuff that uh, would handle, or that would really um, put a fire under that. Um, as far as the other side of it, one day I remember some kids saying something to me that really sparked a fire in me. I punched him. And I realized right then that there was a power there that I had. It was a power that I could control, that nobody could say anything to me if I could just beat him up. And I became essentially a bully. I, um, I enjoyed that. I had a reputation as being tough. Um, I, it was, it was, it was empowering. I can't, I'm not going to lie. It was, um, I wasn't raised in church or anything, so I had nothing to fall back on as far as spirituality or anything. Um, we were more or less agnostic, um, didn't believe in anything. So we were just going along the motions. So being poor, having a cleft palate, being bullied, led me to this position in my life that I had to fight back, um, which led to a lot of other things. Um, eventually, we, my mom and dad got divorced, and uh, we moved to the projects, which was essentially a move up from Mason Park, but it was still, it was a rough neighborhood. Um, and going to a new school, I remember I had to start all that over again. I essentially had to be bullied again um, in order to regain my position as a, the tough guy. Um, it, was, it was a rough walk. I remember uh, beating this kid up, I mean, just pounding him so hard that he had a muffin in his hand it was just crumbling and did nothing and I, I remember thinking at that time I said this isn't worth it man this is just not working again I was trying to force that um, that square peg into the round hole you know that God had to fill in my heart I, I was allowing something else to try to fill it um, so I essentially switched roles into being a bully for the bullies so if I, if I ever saw a bully picking on a little guy that couldn't defend himself, I would beat him up. And I got that reputation. So that was kind of making me feel better about myself. And it was kind of sort of going in the right direction, but still not anything worth, you know, it wasn't filling that void. So once we moved into the projects there, there was, um, we created a kind of a, a family of friends down there. We did have some friends in there. Um, but there was always that tension, it's a, it's a racial tension, let's just be honest with it. And there was one of our friends that were uh, essentially a mouthy kid that would start a lot of stuff and never do anything about it. And we heard about this up in our, up in our uh, apartment building. He was a few apartment buildings down and he was running his mouth off to a, a gang of black kids and they started beating him up. So me and my brother went down there with a bunch of our friends to start this, you know, getting up and to help our friend out. Because, you know, essentially, that's what this fighting was all about. You know, all this fighting that I did was kind of a camaraderie, you know, um, as far as a family, you know, goes. So we went down there, and me and my brother started in on this fight, and there was probably 10 or 15 kids there. And, man, we're just fighting. We're going at it, and it's in the middle of this neighborhood, man, and it's just, there's a a lot of people watching. And I, I get up and I'm looking around and there's just me and my brother fighting. None of the other white kids that were with us um, were fighting. They were sitting over there on the porch. All the people that I grew to love in this family of fighting and whatnot, um, it showed me that it's, it was a farce, man. It wasn't real at all. And it, it showed me something about their friendship. And it, it hurt, it hurt deep. And that was one of those things that kind of led me into, you know, I need something more. I need something else to fill this hole. <clears throat> um, uh, you move up a few more years. I kind of got out of the fighting thing, but then I started partying and filling that void more. Um, just partying and partying, and then you combine that once you start partying with the emotional high that you get from fighting. And it's, uh, 
it's, it's volatile. I can't explain it enough to say that whenever you're drunk, whenever you're high, and your emotions are running high, and people are yelling at you, and people are making fun of you, you're going to explode. You know, I was a ticking time bomb. There was times when I would chase people in my car, me and my brother would chase people all the way down through downtown Akron, jumping on hoods of cars, beating on windshields. We were that type of people, man. We had our, me and my brother were going through Kenmore, through Goodyear Heights, through Ellet, everywhere as being these just fighters. We would go to Coventry to just wear our, um, our Garfield coats just to start a fight. We would, that was our motivation for life, was to show our power through our fighting. Um, the cops would know us, the security guards knew us up there. It was rough, it was a rough life, man. Um, and it's affected me so negatively that I still have trouble with my, my self-worth. Um, and it's, it's hard to deal with, man. It's, it's hard, it's, because I think that the people that I beat up, that if they saw me and I've reached out to them on Facebook and they can't forgive me, I ruined my witness there. I talk about it a lot in small group and whatnot. And uh, those guys, they don't know me now and what God's done in my life. And there's that, that thing in their, their soul that they see me and they see hate. They see me, they see fear. They see me, they see somebody beating them up for nothing other than being smaller or weaker than, than I was. And that's hard, that's a hard thing to swallow. Romans 3.23 talks about, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if I'm beating somebody up because I, it's empowering me, how is that reflective of Christ? It's a, it was a, it's a rough life to live because that just fueled my alcoholism. It fueled my partying. It fueled everything. And eventually it led me to jail. I was in jail for that, and that still wasn't enough to get me off that boat because I was still trying to fill that void. As my partying progressed, um, my friends seemed to disappear. I, I would go to parties sometimes and hang out there, but once they were all done partying, I was still drinking. You know, I, 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 my tolerance level was so high by that point, it was, it was nuts. I remember when I was, I think it was uh, my junior year in high school, I was partying, and I, I remember making the bet with myself, nobody else, that's when you know you got a problem, that I could party every day. I could get a buzz on every day that summer, and I did it. And that's, that's uh, thinking back of that, and it's, you know, Alicia's age, you know, my, my middle daughter's age, um, that's scary. You know, I started partying when Nat, I was Nat's age, and that's scarier, you know, and it was, it was a progressive thing, you know, because in the 70s and early 80s, it was acceptable. You know, there was no uh, mothers against drunk driving, there was no drunk driving laws, there was no seatbelt laws, there was, you know, it was a different time. And by the time I was so slammed addicted to it, then they started that stuff. It was a, a scary time, it was, um, but it was the social norm. Um, nowadays it may be different, but I, the partying is still there, it's just a different chemical. Um, so that partying throughout those, I think that's where it really took a hold of me was those three months straight of drinking every day. I mean, I think you build a habit after three months of doing something every day. Um, it doesn't, and it, it didn't let go. It didn't let go for another 25 years. And think about that, 25 years, you know, that's a long time, a quarter of a century, to be holding on to anger, to holding on to a, a drug that has no end. There's no end in sight. There's no hope, there's no nothing. Um, so that, it was a, uh, it's, don't think you can just handle it, because you, you know, I couldn't. I was going through, you know, through all of this stuff. I remember going to church when I was, you know, even in Mason Park. There was spots in time where God was reaching out to me. I wouldn't allow him in, you know, but there was a, a spot in the early, or late 70s that I went to a church. I remember going, because it was uh, me and a couple buddies of mine. And they kind of coaxed me into going forward, essentially, for salvation. And I'll never forget that. It wasn't, it wasn't me doing it. It wasn't, you know, I was just egged on, you know, essentially another facet of bullying. They just wanted to mock me. But um, the church came back, like, a few weeks later, because I hadn't gone. And they said, God hates people that do that. And that was burned in my head for a long time. 
And that was kind of the situation I had with churches, the relationship I had with churches all through my life. Every time I would go to one or something, there was always a legalistic value to it that I hated because I didn't, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't know anything spiritually wrong with it, but it just wasn't my, it left a bad taste in my mouth, you know, um, until I came here. You know, that's when I, I think ABT changed me you know, that's what I love about this church, man. You know, it's exactly what the Bible says. God doesn't want you to wear a suit to come to see him. He wants you to be you to come to see him. Let him change you from the inside out. You know, and it's, I went through that, like I said, a few different times. And uh, I made a promise to my family and my, my wife about that we weren't going to let the people here, the wounded here at church, drive us away from God again. And um, we, it's working out so far, you know, knock on wood. Um, God is good, man. He is freaking, he is it, period. There is no other. You know, I wouldn't trade this for anything. It's hard, man. It's a hard life. I've, I've lived the life of the partier, the bully, the bullied, and none of it was worth, none of it was uh, fulfilling. Um, fast forward, you know, 40 years, or not 40 years, 20 years um, to when I was 40. And I finally come to the realization that I needed Christ. And all these things started coming out of my life. I started realizing how much he, uh, he showed me that I can be loved, no matter what my cloth palette, no matter what everybody said of me, no matter what anybody said of me. I, I, it's so weird that all of that stuff psychologically damaged me to the point where I don't even feel love. I don't feel like whenever the wife says she loves me, when my kids say she, they love me, it's hard for me to fathom that they can love me. How could anybody love me? That's how rough life was, but Christ switched that around on me. He threw a, a, me a curveball, essentially, on everything I've raised, I was raised on, every sort of fiber of my being that I was, I was built on. My foundation was based on the fact that I was a loser. You know, so you deal with that for 40 years, and then Christ says, you know what, you're not a loser. And it's hard to swallow. So I had to change my perspective on essentially everything I knew for 40 years and focus it on God and his promises for my life and his truth and his word. And it wasn't easy. It's still not easy. But it's worth it. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things I've reached out to. I've met a lot of people I used to beat up. Um, and a lot of them won't forgive me, but a lot of them have, you know. A lot of them I've, I've worked with and talked to and went through all those challenges and stuff, and they see that God can change a person. And if they can change me, you know, they, you know there's, a, there's hope for anybody. It was um, a lot of things that I wish I wouldn't have done, but if I wouldn't have done them, I wouldn't be me. God had me go through those things for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of people I feel I can talk to because of them, because of those things in my past that I still use today to glorify him that brought me out of it. Um, there's just uh, a lot, man. It's, it's, uh, it's scary to think of where I could have been if it wasn't for Christ. Um, and I, I think about that a lot. You know, whenever I start getting fired up for God, I think of those things, how he brought me out of that slavery. You know, I try to remember that. I try to remember what um, I was before God cleaned me up and bandaged me up and saved me. So after a long period of uh, being away from the church, we, uh, we started coming to ABT. We were invited, I was still partying. I was still living the lie. I came here for the family again. I didn't do it for myself. I did it for uh, my benefit, essentially, to help my daughters and my wife be better people while I could still live my life the way I wanted to. And. Uh, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Court, wanted to go on a mission trip. And uh, I was like, you know what, I'm not gonna let you go down there alone without you know, some sort of guardian. She's never been away from home alone. Yeah, I still didn't trust the church. I just figured it was a big hypocrisy in the way. You know, I, I was raised essentially to believe. Um, so I was gonna go down there and basically babysit her. Um, and I don't think she was aware of that. I think she was just excited that I was going down because the, the Holy Spirit already had a hold on her. Um, once I got down there, though, everything changed. I mean, the kids down there, we did a, a, a BBS 
for a bunch of uh, down and out kids, essentially. Um, but they loved on me. I mean, it was a real love that I've never, not, I never allowed myself to feel before. Um, because I, uh, and that was, that changed me from the inside out. Um, and I came, you know, through that week, I started hanging out with kids. I started talking to the students. Um, some of the, you know, the students I got close to, uh, I still am in, in uh, contact with them because they changed me. You know, they, they allowed me to allow the spirit to change me. Um, that I, it's, it's amazing. It was an amazing week. It was an amazing story just because um, what I had planned on going down there for was not what I went down there for. God had a completely different plan in mind and he got a hold of me. He put his claws in me and has not let go. Um, and my cynicism and my pride and all of them things, all the, the things that I was raised with, the, my inner being didn't want this to happen. Um, and that's a hard battle to overcome. And it's been five years now, going on six years, and it's still something I battle with. Um, but this church, God, Jesus, has allowed me to overcome that. And that's, that's a, something you just can't, you can't buy, you can't drink, you can't shoot up, you can't smoke, you can't snort, you can't you know, hold on to. It's just something real, you know, something that's finally real that doesn't end you know, in tragedy. You know? uh, there's just things that, that I've done in my life that God has saved me from that there's just not enough thanks in the world for. I believe uh, he's got a purpose for my life. He's got a purpose for everybody's life. We just have to grasp it, hold on to it, awaken the spirit in us. Um, I'm Mike Dean. I'm second. <laughs>